coming for yet another um, very exciting webinar. We are here today um, talking about moving Kenya forward, oil production and new exploration under COVID-19. Um, looking at the state of transition of Kenya's oil and gas sector, um, the implications of COVID-19 and also tying in some regional aspects um, as the Lake Albert development project in Uganda moves ahead. Before I introduce uh, my co-moderator, Liz, I'm going to take care of a couple housekeeping items. Um, so if everybody can look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a chat box. Um, and on this chat box, if you click this, um, we're going to encourage all of our audience members to be chatting with each other in the, in the chat box to get some engagement. Um, but please note, in order to chat with all of the panelists, um, if you can click on the two button, and click all panelists or all panelists and attendees. Um, if you click all panelists and attendees, you'll be chatting with each other um, as opposed to just the panelists. Um, there is also a Q&A box. Um, if you'll click on that, you can submit questions during the webinar um, for the panelists and we'll be getting to those questions throughout the conversation. Um, <clears throat> If everybody can take a minute to um, type in the chat box just where you're from, uh, maybe what company you're with, um, so we can kind of see you know, the range of diversity. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn um, the webinar over to my co-moderator, Elizabeth Rogo, President for East Africa of the African Energy Chamber, to start the conversation. Thank you very much, Katie. I'm very excited uh, to host this webinar. Um, on Kenya's mo moving Kenya forward, oil production and new exploration under COVID-19. I have a fantastic panel and I know that everybody's going to enjoy it. If we go past two hours, I won't be surprised, but we'll make sure that we do keep time. And welcome everybody, all, everybody from all over the world. Welcome, Karibu. And um, we are going to start looking at uh, answering some pertinent questions that everybody is asking about Kenya, the East Africa region. But before that, I think this will be a good time to introduce our panel. And um, I'm going to start off with um, Wendy Nyaga. Wendy, are you there? Wendy Nyaga is the Chief Finance Officer for Oil Field Movers. Uh, he's an oil and gas professional and business leader with over 15 years in the oil and gas industry. He's currently the CFO of, the, of Oil Fields Movers Limited based in Nairobi, which he co-founded in 20, 2012. OML is a leading logistics service provider in the oil and gas industry in Eastern Africa. I definitely agree to that. Um, Wendy also uh, founded the Oil and Energy Services Limited in 2011, a boutique advisory firm that provides consulting services to the clients. He has been in the forefront of formulating local content strategies in the oil and gas business in Kenya. Before founding Oil and Energy Services and co-founding OML, Mwendia was the CEO of the National Oil Corporation of Kenya and later consultant to the Ministry of Energy. Thank you very much, um, Wendy, for um, gracing us with your presence. We now have our, one of our favorite panelists. We would like to bring him on, Honorable Dr. Eli Karuhanga from Uganda. This man has such a long CV, I don't even know what to do, but we will try and summarize it, Dr. Eli. Uh, Dr. Eli is the founding partner of the Kampala Associated Advocates. He's currently the founding chairman of the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, as well as the chairman of the Private Sector Alliance of Uganda. Um, Dr. Eli has, has many, many accolades, too many for me to, to talk about, but um, he's been very, very um, uh, pertinent or uh, important in the Uganda oil and gas sector. Uh, he was once the president for mm -hmm. Tala Oil and is one of the main advisors that we go to and also a big advisor in the country as well as internationally as to what is happening in the Uganda sector. So not only was he president and the director of TALO, but Dr. Eli comes with many, many accolades, as well as being the honorary council general of the Republic of Seychelles to Uganda. So we look forward to coming to Seychelles very soon, Dr. Eli Karuhanga. Um, well, our, the thank opening you. Ellen, Ellen is a welcome on the photo. Thank, thank you, Dr. Eli. Our next panelist is another favorite, Brian Moriyuki, who's uh, currently the managing director and country chair for Ro Royal Dutch Shell in Ghana. 
Um, Brian used to be also the country manager for Kenya, uh, where he oversaw activities, exploration activities for Kenya, Somalia, and Z Zanzibar. And he currently sits on the Skills for Oil and Gas Africa steering board and is a board director of the British Chamber of Commerce um, in Kenya. He's um, currently also serving as, as an advisor to the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining in Kenya. Prior to his appointment- Former advisor. Ah, did I say that? Sorry, former advisor, yes. Prior to his appointment in Kenya, Brian worked in Iraq and the UAE as a commercial manager for Shell's exploration and production business in Iraq. So we know that uh, Brian is going to bring a, a lot of foresight as to what is happening and good commercial aspects. So we look forward to talking to you. Um, another favorite son, son of Africa, uh, Mr. Tokes Aziz. Mr. Tokes Aziz is um, not only the sales and commercial director for Sub-Sahara Africa for Baker Hughes, he's also the managing director for Kenya Baker Hughes. Uh, Tokes has more than 25 years of international experience in oil field with Baker Hughes and, is, and as I said, currently sits here in, in Kenya. Um, he's also an executive director for several Baker Hughes subsidiaries within Sub-Sahara Africa. And he has worked extensively in the oil field service in the swamp, offshore, land environment of Africa, Europe, and the USA. He has acquired experience in business development, technical sales, legal compliance, and, and applications engineering, and held leadership and management roles within product line and product uh, company responsibility. He is currently involved in commercial and technical strategy formulation for all Baker Hughes product companies in SSA. We're, we welcome you, uh, Mr. Tokes. I know that people are going to ask you lots, of, lots and lots of questions as we, as we look to see how we can get into this oil and gas industry. Last but not least, um, we have a lady on the panel, and I'm very excited. I should have actually started off with you, um, Doris Murigi. Doris Murigi is the Chief Operating Officer of Energy Solutions Africa, and I'm very, very honored to, to have her here. She's a seasoned and accomplished energy professional with over 15 years experience in energy, oil and gas, and infrastructure advisory at a corporate level, both locally and internationally. She had been involved in notable projects in critical emerging sectors in East Africa. In particular, she has advised on policy development, negotiations, and transactions. She is now the MD, as we said, of ESAL Africa, a leading Africa-focused advisory firm that offers solutions to key players in the oil and gas industry. Um, Ms. Marik is a lawyer by, by training and also uh, used to work for the National Oil uh, Company of Kenya and is also an advisory and consultant. Welcome, Doris. I'm very, very pleased to have you here as our only woman panelist. So, uh, ladies, lady and gentlemen, let's start. So the Kenya oil and gas industry is in a state of transition as its major oil and gas development that's blocked 10 BB and 13 T in Turkana was put on hold with Tala Oil submitting a notice of force majeure to the Kenya Ministry of Petroleum and Mining last week, citing complications from COVID-19. At the same time, Uganda's Lake Albert project, that's Tilenga, is at last moving ahead, uh, with Total announcing plans to acquire Tala Oil's stake in the project. The massive development in Uganda, which is set to include a pipeline and refinery, could easily have an impact on regional oil and gas developments and opportunities. How can Kenya's domestic companies in the industry re-strategize to capture the expected opportunities in the Albertine project? What are the opportunities for Kenya's oil and gas industry in the near term? Given the delay of the Trukana project, what are the strategies for Kenya's domestic companies to make it through the downturn? What are the impacts, both short-term and long-term, for countries particularly hit by COVID in this region? <coughs> First of all, I think the burning question I'd like to ask, and I, I will point that to you, Brian Maruki, is the force majeure that was announced last week by Talo Oil. Where does that put the Kenya development? Um, thanks. Um, and good afternoon, folks. But I think uh, force majeure, interestingly, I'm still waiting to see the government's response to the force majeure notice that has been put in place. But effectively, what force majeure does is that it stops the clock. And so what you see happening is, 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 is there will be um, a clock stopping on, on, on any and all, whether it's from the commercial side or the technical side. If the government does indeed um, take that force majeure notice and accept it, then the clock stops. 
up to and until the force majeure is lifted. Um, so interestingly, uh, it was of interest to note and see um, a further announcement on the EOPS project from, from Talo um, ar ar around that. But effectively, you know, my understanding of force majeure is the clock stops on everything um, up and until it is lifted. Um, so what you see then, of course, is um, clearly everything from a schedule perspective will shift to the right um, in terms of, of potential delays to everything from, from FID and to project execution. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Tokes, as, a, as the head of a global oil service company who has done a lot of work in this region, what does this force majeure do to you? Your mic is off. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, well for us, what it really means is that uh, we have to recalibrate uh, our plans. We've been in uh, very, very detailed negotiations and discussions with Tello about the upcoming work. Uh, we'll sort of take uh, a breather and reassess uh, what sort of level of readiness we need to be at, uh, sh should and when the force majeure uh, get lifted. We also kind of have to look and see, um, in terms of running costs for the project itself, what, what's the implication? not just for the partners, but also for the uh, service companies and the community that might have, have had plans to, or who had debated having some activities starting sometime next year, because FID was meant to be uh, end, of, uh, end of this year. So for us, uh, we continue to negotiate and discuss with uh, Tolo and their partners in terms of the potential for the awards and the tenders and uh, we don't stop anything until we're told to do that. Mm, okay. So, Wendy, um, you're an entrepreneur in the oil and gas sector. When I heard the fourth majeure, I took my newspaper and I threw it across the desk. I was like, oh, not another stumbling block. How does that affect you as a, as a businessman? Uh, what, what are the precautions or what are the steps you're taking right now uh, to make sure that you're still in business? Thanks, Liz, and uh, thanks, everyone. Um, happy to meet you here uh, online. I, I think, as Brian says, you know, force majeure stops the clock. And um, uh, apparently, this force majeure comes in the backdrop of uh, some other announcements uh, that we had read in the press around uh, Talo and Total um, intending to sell 50% of their holding, each one of them. And uh, then you see force majeure and uh, Again, you have seen the announcements around EOPT. And um, first, uh, farm out itself takes a long time. We have seen how long farm out can take if we take Uganda as a reference. And um, uh, so that already was a big spanner in the works because uh, usually that kind of thing can go either way. Now we have this, um, which um, uh, you would expect, you know, when, when government gets up with a force majeure, the government will respond. Perhaps there will be some negotiations going on around um, whether really uh, the force majeure should be called or not. So as a business person, I, I literally also have to uh, know that uh, the projections that one may have made uh, may not hold anymore. And then uh, you need to perhaps put yourself in a situation where you know that whatever you expected to help in, to happen in the next 12 months may now happen in the next 24 or even 36 months. So you would expect that uh, um, decisions will delay, approvals uh, will delay, and uh, therefore our business, uh, Liz, as you say you're, yourself, an, ex an entrepreneur, whatever you projected that you may be able to do in Kenya's oil development, um, you will need to, to slow down the clock as well and um, uh, push those activities further out. Well, I know we have a knight in, in shining armor in the name of Dr. Karuhanga, but before I get to Dr. Karuhanga, um, I see Doris. Doris, what is your take? Um, again, you're also an, a business uh, lady, an entrepreneur with a very strong legal background. You've seen all these force majeures and all this stuff going on. What is your take as to what we need to do for those of us in Kenya? I think, uh, thank you for having me and good evening, everyone. I think for me, the, as everybody has said, it means that we are on hold. The clock has stopped. 
uh, I don't, I haven't seen the actual, what they cited as the actual, for them to cite force majeure, but it will, you know, as a lawyer, it will actually depend on the actual, the factual circumstances they are claiming, and also the, the actual clause. If it's the generic one that we see in the uh, model production sharing contract, then it, the discussions will be up for long. But what I'm hoping is that, uh, you know, the government, and I see many government of uh, ministry people here, I hope they can, you know, analyze the circumstances for force majeure and just discuss and hopefully lift this up soon. So I hope, you know, the, the, the entire, I know I, I understand the matter has now been taken to the attorney general, but I hope we can have then the discussions first so that we can have this force majeure lifted. But definitely, I don't see FID in the, this, this year. So basically what you're saying, just because Talo may have um, claimed force majeure, doesn't necessarily mean that it's been accepted. Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It's, just, it's just something they put out in public, so we're waiting to see the government's response. Yes, the government response, because actually, what did, what was the, what did they actually cite as the circumstances for the force majeure? And then also, how is that clause in the PSC that they have signed define force majeure? You could yes. find some lawyers have been having a field day on the force majeure clauses who would have thought that a boilerplate uh, uh, clause could now be so highly negotiated, so highly contentious. So it will depend on the actual PSC and what they cited as their circumstances. So Ellie, Dr. Ellie, uh, Total did not, um, did not ask for force majeure. Um, I think they're well within their rights if, they, if you look at this COVID issue. Um, what is your take when we look at Kenya versus uh, what's happening in Uganda? Uh, the, Dr. Eli, your mic is off. Dr. Eli, your mic, hello. Microphone, please. Okay, while Dr. while Dr. Ellie is busy, try, okay, are we there, Dr. Ellie? Okay. Ah, there we are. I think I'm on now, right? Yes, you're on. Thank you, Dr. Ellie. So what is your take? Why didn't Total um, also ask for force majeure in respect to what's happening and, you know, when you look at the Kenya, um, Kenya, Uganda situation? Good evening, everyone. I am... Um... I want, Elizabeth, I want you to inform and allow me to inform the listeners that I'm a Ugandan, yes, but I'm almost a full-time Kenyan, because I think this is one of the countries in the world, Kenya, and, and it's my favorite country. I participated in the licensing discussions for Talo in Kenya, when I was president of Talon in Uganda and advising them in Africa. And I want to tell you that neither Talon nor Kenya government would ever want, no oil company would ever want to declare a force majeure. Why? Because they invest so much money in the business and they really want their money back and they want their profits. It's a sad day when that event takes place in a company. And these issues which come and for just for people who are not lawyers, these words, force majeure, are really the act of God, something that is beyond their, their means to control the problem that they are faced with. And so it is, it, so it is, it is unfortunate that this has happened in Kenya, and it is unfortunate that Dalo had to exercise that clause in the PSA. But um, when you think about the reasons that they are faced they, they had no alternative but to declare a force majeure. And I think the Attorney General would find it very, very difficult to actually reject it because I, I don't think that they freeze the excuse. The times are difficult. Uh, even without COVID-19, the challenges that they were facing in uh, that area the floods, the water, the, then their financial challenge, everything just did not work out. But that doesn't mean that the people of Kenya 
should feel very frustrated and lose hope because things never ever remain the same. The important thing is that the oil is there, it's in the ground. Kenya is a country that is really, really gifted with natural resources, both onshore and offshore. And uh, the Talo situation, Talo is just one of the company. Kenya in East Africa is the most investigated country. Your geology is the most investigated, and without doubt, we all suspect for a moment that Kenya might have the largest resources in oil. In fact, if you didn't even have the disputes with the Somali, I think that the first major vital would be of no concern. The only challenge we have is that Taro was the first company to discover oil in Kenya, like it was the first one to discover oil in Uganda. And yes, Total has de decided to close mm -hmm. FID by the end of this year. And we are excited about that. But so remember that we are negotiating and haggling with oil. Sorry to interrupt. We'll, we'll get more onto the, the Uganda side. Well, I just wanted to interrupt yes. you a little bit, Dr. Ellie. Um, we'll talk a little bit more on the Uganda side, but you hit on a point where Kenya is involved. Kenya has a lot of resources. We tend to just look at Talo oil, and I'm glad you brought that up. Brian, we need to start looking at other uh, projects that we have, and we, I'd, I'd like us to go a little bit on um, offshore, the offshore projects. Dr. Ellie also brought the Somali-Kenya Kenya issue. Um, it's Brian there. Can we discuss a little bit on what other opportunities are there uh, besides the Tunnel Oil Project? Brian, before yeah. you start, I'm going to jump in quickly. Can all of the speakers, can you please make sure uh, any phones and things are muted? We're getting some dings coming over. Um, and we're also muting microphones um, when we can. So make sure before you speak that you unmute your microphone just to try to eliminate some of this background noise. All right. Sorry, Brian. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks, Liz. So, so indeed, I, I think the project that has been in the news, um, you know, from, from the onset of when oil was discovered, of course, is the Lucky Char project. But um, one of the things that we know in our business is, is you need to keep exploring and you need to keep growing the resource base. Um, and in order to be able to actually have a knock-on effect and have more investors coming into the sort of oil and gas play for East Africa. Um, and so one of the very interesting things is on the offshore, we know that there is the Mlima prospect um, in blocks operated by ENI. Now, um, you know, not to belittle the Lokita project, but when you think about Mlima, if you think about the geology of the region, it is most likely that will be gas if the exploration well is drilled and hopefully with a nice oil rim to help the economics. Now that sort of project is in ultra deep water. But that is the sort of project that you're looking at, you know, a cost basis of between 19 to $40 billion for an offshore project of that magnitude. Now, if you compare that to the 3 to $4 billion in Trukana, I'm not saying that Trukana is Trump change, but I'm saying the ability of that to transform the economy of Kenya is something that is completely noteworthy. So let's not only focus on the Trukana Lokicha project, let's also think about what other opportunities we can generate particularly the emphasis on drilling this exploration well offshore um, in the, the Mlima prospect, because that has huge potential. Um, and, and, and it's something that could transform not just Kenya, but the whole of the East African region. I'm um, thinking about what you do in terms of big uh, gas plays, gas to power options. Um, so it's something that needs to be looked at. And, and you know, I'm personally hoping that uh, the government and, and ENI can come to a quick uh, agreement on the terms for that so that that well can be drilled. Yeah, I'm very happy to hear that. In fact, that kind of leads me on to um, Mr. Tokes, Tokes Aziz. Uh, we'll, if you're going to start looking at offshore projects, I mean, this is a whole different ball game. Um, I think many of the, uh, the local or indigenous service companies, as you've seen, have, have been mainly onshore-based companies. How can they make that transition? And where does a company such as Baker Hughes Play, play a major role? Because offshore is also one of your, your big fortes. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Liz. <clears throat> the transition to, to deep water um, for us is not going to be uh, difficult at all because we're already involved in deep water uh, projects uh, across East, West and uh, Southern Africa. 
down in the south uh, in Mozambique, we're very, very, uh, very active with uh, with ENI already uh, in their deep water uh, LNG project, and we're looking at doing the same with Total, who have uh, taken over the Anadarko block. Then you've got Exxon as well, who are also uh, making a play uh, further down south in Mozambique. So the transition is not going to be that difficult. For us, it's more about how can we get our local partners who in Kenya have been involved on the onshore to then up their game a little bit to meet the offshore deep water requirements. And that's going to take uh, a lot of uh, back, back and forth, a lot of integration, a lot of uh, collaboration to get them to the point where the skill set of their personnel and the equipment that they have or that they intend to acquire is going to meet um, the requirements of, of uh, a deep water play. I have no doubt that uh, from what we've seen that that can be achieved. Uh, it's more a matter of the um, ability of the tripartite agreement between the operators, uh, the main contractor and the subcontractors to sort of partition out what the roles are. In other words, if you're looking at um, capability uh, development within the region, or you're looking at the transfer of technology, or even the transfer of skills, even uh, such skills as welding, you know, welders that you're going to need uh, to be used at a deep water offshore, even on the pipeline, those kind of things have to be planned well ahead in order to ensure that the, the sub-region takes uh, maximum advantage of the opportunities that will come for, for the population. That's something that Becky Hughes uh, is always very, 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 very engaged in doing and in planning. And we're already in advanced discussions with uh, the likes of Ian and I about what they would want to do uh, in the deep water. And then there are a few more uh, small players as well who are also looking at gas in the south as well, just off the coast, you know, on Patty Island. Uh, there too, there's some prospects there. They will be very small, but this is the kind of um, activity that will help to ginger the uh, local entrepreneurship into having further and continuous engagement with the industry. And furthermore, you've got to look at it and say, how can we ensure that we tap into the, the young talent that's coming out of the universities and the technical colleges uh, across the country and get them engaged so that they understand what is a foot and what opportunities are going to be uh, available for them. Thank you. And this brings me now to um, a, a point that Dr. Ellie is always hammering about, this regional um, integration. I just want to move away from the offshore and, and really kind of discuss more with Dr. Ellie. Um, you're a big proponent of not national, but regional integration and regional cooperation between um, Eastern Africa companies and, and also companies from across other parts of, of Africa, like Ni Nigeria. Um, I see your mic is off. Are you having problems unmuting? Could you kindly unmute, please? <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Ah, there you go. There you, you are. Know, uh, you know, there is, a, there is something that many people in, oil, in the oil industry don't regard as very important. But I want to tell you what I have experienced. The political leaders are very, very important in the development of this industry. And I want to congratulate the political class in Kenya and the executive, the way they have been in the oil industry. They are loved by oil companies because their response is always spontaneous, quick, and decisive. And they, for example, the RA production of oil for Tano. It was a very good decision by the political class. And they put Kenya on, on the radar in the oil in the old world. And so the political class in here is so significant. So what we are looking for in the region is for people not to become too obsessed with our riches. Now we must milk everything from oil companies and frustrate them from working. So I want to give that tip to the Kenya government. We have always really, really admired the way they have been working. Thank you. Uh, the Once second thing is that 
One, I think about about uh, ten years ago, I landed on a, a CIA document uh, which was published. I picked it from Google, and this this region needs has resources that in order to exploit them more than ten trillion dollars, and they earmarked Kenya, they earmarked Uganda, South Sudan, Somalia, Mozambique, Tanzania. Even the gas in Lake Chivu in Rwanda, oil in Tanganyika, and all that. And it showed that this was a huge, huge resource for the world economy. But the leaders now must start to think together and to see whether we can develop these resources together. The declaration of post major in uh, Lake Chivu is it's not, it's, it's a small item in the big cake of things in the region. What we now need is to resume the discussions of our political leaders to see how they can act together to develop this resource. Because it is so capital-intensive. And because of that, the leaders have to work together to develop these resources together. The infrastructure required is so colossal, so important. Look at what Kenya had done with the Lam port and the amount of investment they had put up to prepare for the oil that was coming, look at the oil production steps they are taking. So we are very excited about the resources. And as I said, uh, I think one of them, this is a, a diplomatic resource because it brings the leaders to think together. Look, even our friends in the Democratic Republic of Congo, they have to be part of us in order to develop this infrastructure for, for, for this resource together. So yes, we have the resource. I am very sure that when they, by the end of the day, Kenya's resources, I am sorry that um, um, at Woodside, uh, you know, after spending about $200 million had to leave because um, they, they, they sank the oil and found water. But, but that doesn't mean that, that, you know, the exploration of oil, what it is, it takes time. Yes. As yes. the said, things take time. And I just call upon the Kenyan government to be patient and then work very closely with the oil company and continue to be very active with the investors. So let me ask and you. And continue having this. Okay. Business so, thinking. Yeah, sorry, it's Dr. A very big thing for so I don't mean to interrupt you. We're just having a lot of um, yes. a little bit of delay with your feedback, and I just want to make sure that um, everyone gets a chance with some of these questions. You made some fantastic points, and I see um, even Sam Wale has congratulated you on making sure that the role of the political uh, class is is taken into consideration. Um, um Wendy. As a businessman, I mean, we've been hearing about this regional uh, integration. It was happening. It's not happening. COVID has come. It's come back up again. And then you've got the climate, the climate change discussion coming in. Uh, I want to know from you as a businessman, um, how strong are you in terms of the, the regional uh, participation? Do you think that really is the way we should be pushing and maybe advising our 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 governments to really maybe look at having East Africa as a block. Why don't we just develop this as a block <clears throat> as opposed to individual company, uh, countries? Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, my view for, for these projects has always been that of uh, synergizing as opposed yeah. to competing. In that, uh, and, and this and subject we've even one on one uh, had a lot of discussion with Ellie on how we can all work together to ensure that um, uh, instead of competing, we are, we are working together to, to, to share the opportunities that exist. There are a lot of synergies that are there. Um, it's been mentioned about uh, the local resources could be finite, and even the local businesses which can do this could be finite. But if the people can work together, then uh, what you're likely to start seeing is that uh, companies can scale up from uh, the location at which they are based uh, and start working in other places. And I'll give a, a, a couple of examples. One is uh, when uh, uh, Talo Oil was drilling out in, uh, in Trukana uh, during the uh, uh, exploration and appraisal uh, process, and at some point they even had five rigs which were up there. 
we cooperated with a Ugandan company that had been um, carrying out the logistics uh, of Talo and um, other, other companies in Uganda. And we worked very, very well together to ensure that we provided uh, an excellent service. And that company, of course, we still uh, discuss and we agree that uh, should um, activities start in Uganda before it starts in Kenya, then we would be there. As, as OML, we are, we are registered in Uganda. We are registered in the Petroleum Authority of Uganda in the database that is there as required by the law. We have gone down to Mozambique and started to look uh, for uh, how can we participate in the large projects, uh, the LNG development projects that are going to be there in the northern Mozambique. And, and for me, it is easier for local businesses to expand in the region as opposed to uh, completely foreign businesses coming from far away and setting base to provide services which are already available. So for me, um, it's a big support for cooperation. It's a big support for even governments because infrastructure can be shared. Um, I know we've uh, we this talk about the pipeline, one of them going through Tanzania from Uganda and one going to Lamu from Kenya. is still not yet completely behind us because uh, no ground has been broken for any. I just keep hoping that the parties involved could actually come back to the table and discuss and see that one pipeline could be better than two. That is a good cooperation that can be there um, already and, and many, many more leads. So for me, uh, it's cooperation, it's synergizing um, and not co uh, competition. So you make a very good point. Before I get to Dr. Eli Karuhanga in terms of, of the pipeline, I, I just want to know um, from you, uh, Mr. Tokes, um, do you see the fact that a lot of expats have left mainly because of COVID? Um, do, do you see that now as an opportunity for local companies to really um, up their game? Do they have enough time to do that for those that are already in it and those who are hoping to come in, into it? Um, you know, I think, I think we're at a crossroads here. It's a very, very important um, time of transition. And East Africa actually has an opportunity right now to do things a little bit more, a little bit differently from what has been done in West Africa, in the likes of Nigeria, and even in the likes of Angola. Um, mostly because you've got something to look back on and say, how, how did it go there? Where were the pitfalls? And I think absolutely synergizing and also um, bringing, bringing the countries together with a sub-regional strategy would be best for everybody uh, because there's still a lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, projects that will come up. The one thing that I think we, or the, the politicians, the governments have to really work hard at is the legislation. Uh, because it's one thing for the, um, the heads of government to declare and say, Kenya wants to work with Tanzania or Tanzania wants to work with Uganda. What more important is that they must have legislation that enables that, that enables the entrepreneurs to be able to adequately access um, both funds, uh, access technology, access partnerships from abroad that will attract those partnerships that will bring in the required expertise, the required technologies and the required financing such that the entrepreneurs can get off on a very, very, uh, on an easier footing or even have a soft landing when activity picks up. So the projects, you know, as we said, can definitely be multi, multi uh, cross, across borders. The pipelines, uh, whether it's going through, you get from Uganda, from Tanzania to Tanga, or it's going, then you've got the one from Kenya, from through Canada down to the coast that might end up uh, maybe extending on into Uganda. All of these things can be uh, developed if it's done in a, in a regionally strategic manner, rather than each uh, country looking upon itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I think is why it makes it exciting that it's very, it's very possible for East Africa to develop um, into a major energy hub, especially for gas, uh, where you've got what's going on in Mozambique. And if you, tap, you add on to that what might go on in, um, in Kenya, if you and I do just strike, plus what Equino have found in Tanzania. You've got a huge gas plate. The biggest projects in Africa right now by far are gas projects. And why that's even more important is that it is cleaner energy 
they're not. So in as much as you want a balance, you want you do want the oil, and, and that's going to be useful. But if you can get clean gas, clean energy coming into it, I mean, the geothermal that you have in, in, in Kenya, then it, it, you know, I think the future is really exciting and, uh, and very promising across the sub-region. Excellent. Okay. I, I'd like us to get in some questions. Thank you very much, Tok. That's a fantastic answer. I'd like us to get some questions. So um, do I have Katie? Katie, yeah, can we start is. off with uh, Arnold? I think Arnold has a good question for Brian. Yes, so we're going to get in some questions from the audience. And I also want to remind everybody in the audience, please feel free to submit your questions. Um, if you click on that Q&A box down there in the corner, um, we're going to start um, asking a lot more of your questions. Um, so we have a question from Arnold um, at ENI Kenya. Um, what's your take on the government of Kenya's decision to review the tax status from exempt to standard rated of supplies imported for oil and gas exploration purposes? Um, this is according to the tax laws amendment bill 2020. So is that for myself? Yes. Okay. Um, so thanks Arnold for the question. Um, I, I think, look, um, I always say, and you know, we're Africans. So I always say that, uh, you know, you, you, you don't kill the cow before you start milking it. And I've said this before several. Yeah. Ideally fiscal policy should always be around collection of, rev of, of taxes from revenues, not from capital expenditure. Because if you, if, if, if you stifle capital expenditure, then you can basically kill a project before it has a chance to take off. And so, you know, we really think that the fiscal policy, whilst we understand, of course, the huge strain at the moment, COVID related and otherwise on, on, on the East African economies around revenue collection by governments, um, we really need to take into account the long-term we should not be myopic and think long term about the, the spin off effects and the, the generative power of oil and gas in the region if it is allowed to, to, to be in a climate that is investable. And so, so, so my view has always been, you know, you should always look at fiscal incentives that allow, you know, fair and equitable taxation on revenues, um, but allow an, an investment environment that allows investors to come in. You know, because every dollar of capital in, in our industry can go anywhere in the world. Yeah. So as, as, as much as we think we are special, we are not. East Africa, the big companies and the smaller and the mid-sized oil and gas companies will look at the investment climate as to where they get greater bang for their buck. Yeah. And that will mean that if, if the East African region, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Sudan, does not have favorable fiscals, then the dollars will go elsewhere you know, where, where you get, get better bang for your buck. So there is a balance. And so my, my plea always is, is when government is looking at this, to be able to enable an environment where investment will be made, knowing that the risk is carried by the investors initially, and they're carrying all the risk, and if they find nothing, well, they can go away. Um, but allow that to happen so that we can explore and increase our resource base, yeah? And then you can tax revenues. So let's not kill the cow before we start milking. If I just may add on quickly to that uh, question from Arnold, um, Brian, what is it that we need to learn from the Uganda situation? Because they've managed to resolve all these uh, taxation issues. Yeah, so, so I, I, think, um, I think the ability to think that, you know, this is a partnership and it's like a marriage. It's a long-term partnership. Any companies that are coming in are coming in to invest for the long haul, 10, 20, you know, 30 years, you know. This is not a mistress who's here today and gone tomorrow. And so it should be treated as a partnership yeah, where effectively um, we work in a collaborative fashion. Now, it, it, if you look at Uganda, it has taken time to get there, but they've gotten there. And I think there's been a lot of work done by the companies and in tandem with the government to reach terms that are, are deemed fair on both sides because both sides have to benefit. You know, uh, If I look at Kenya, the government of Kenya wants the people of Kenya to reap maximum benefit from these resources but the companies also want to make a decent uh, return on their investment. And so, um, I mean, what we can look at from Uganda, A, is the resilience that, that was seen there to be able to get through these tough negotiations over a protracted period of time, but they got there. And we should also think about, well, for us, what can we learn and we try and shorten the time spans that we have in trying to do these negotiations, knowing that it should be equitable and we should be able to get to a place where this is a long-term marriage that is collaborative and find a collaborative uh, way in which we can get to terms that enable investment to go ahead. 
So I think we'll look at next week when the finance, um, the finance bill is presented next week. Um, Katie, you want to move on? Um, we have a question for Doris. I think we actually have a couple. Yeah, so we're, we're actually getting a lot more questions in. So um, Doris, this question was actually directed um, directly to you from Sylvia. Um, re and actually, while we're, well, before I read the, before I turn it over, I'm gonna read our poll results. So the question is um, regarding keeping hope. Doris, what are your perspectives on the oil industry taking a double hit, i.e. negative oil prices in COVID-19? Is this the end of oil? Um, and I'm going to read our poll results quickly. We asked, what is your outlook for progress in Kenya's oil and gas sector given the current environment? 36% of respondents said positive, 38% said neutral, 27% said negative. So with that, Doris, I'll hand it over to you. The oil, the, is oil ending? No, I, I, I don't believe that. so. We're definitely in a transition but I don't think it's time to buy the coffins for the oil yet. When you talk about the transition, when you look at uh, as a region in that Kenya, we are already at the forefront in terms of uh, green energy. And uh, if you look at us, we are, on, we are still dependent very little on fossil fuel. So we find that we are ahead of the curve in terms of uh, green energy in, term, in, the, in Kenya and even in the region. So it's something we are already ahead of the curve. However, I'm still an oil girl and believe oil and gas will still be part of the energy mix for a very long time. So we still will see an, uh, oil and gas. And in any case, the oil prices have already, as you can see globally, they've, they've now risen to the pre-COVID days. So the oil prices are, you know, are coming up. And if you look at even the equity markets, the, the prices are now good for oil companies. So I think oil and gas will still play a major role in the oil and gas mix and will be here. And in any case, we are, as uh, Brian mentioned, we are a gas frontier. We are more gas prone. So we'll see also gas playing a very big role in the sector. Thank you, thank you. Um, is there another question for, for, for Doris or shall I answer a question that was uh, relayed to me from Brian? <laughs> Why don't you do the question for you, Liz? Yes, Brian Mishimba, you asked me um, whether there's any platform for oil and that oil and gas experts interact to share knowledge and ideas in Kenya. Brian, you have arrived. It's here, the <laughs> African Energy Chamber. Um, it was formed a month ago. I think so. we're now almost two months old. And uh, these are the sort of things we're doing. We, we bring you knowledgeable experts. We have discussion groups going on. So please come on, join. And anyone else, please join our forum. Um, we're here to help everybody. We're here to help students, politicians, entrepreneurs. We are providing a very open platform. We disseminate um, information. We don't hide anything. We're here to form uh, you know, good, strong partnerships. So welcome. Next question. Katie? <clears throat> continue. So we have a question from um, Deborah Rogo that I think could be interesting and I'm actually not sure who to address it to. Maybe Liz, you can get more specific. Um, what are your thoughts on the potential impact of oil and gas exploration on vulnerable host communities and their environment? Um, and I'll just add a little tweak to that question and say, um, you know, what, what should be done in order to make sure that those communities are not just protected, um, but that they're able to benefit from these resources? Um, that are within their communities. I think I'd like to address that to Dr. Eli Karuhanga because uh, as you know, their projects, um, they're, they're working in a very vulnerable area, the, the Queen Elizabeth Murchison, I think that's what it's called, the big park. And uh, the environment has been a, a big issue for them. Uh, Dr. Ke Dr. Eli, are you there? Yeah. So did you get the question? You know, Dr. Um... This industry is not for the faint-hearted. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay. We can hear you. Okay, I was, I was saying that this industry is not for the faint-hearted. Um, because after you finish negotiating with the big boys in the big city, the big politicians, you go and confront the real people who live where the oil is. And down there, there are challenges. And you have to be ready to confront them. Uh, in our situation, of course, you know, 
oil is, I, I, I say, God has a very good sense of humor. You put oil where it's very difficult to reach, takes it away from the people and puts it in areas which are not so occupied. But in our case, we put it in the national park, pristine area. And now we have to deal with the lions and, and all the animals that uh, will come for you if you misbehave. So we have to be very, very careful. Also with the traditional leaders, chiefs, pastorists, people who are uncompromising in their decisions, once they have made a decision, you have to deal with them. The next group we are going to be in Karamoja, next to the Tukanas. You know what you can face if you try to misbehave with the Tukanas. And these oil companies, they have to have, uh, you know, they have to have a, a big heart. They have to understand their different cultures and they have to recalibrate their thinking and about their lifestyle, the expensive price lifestyles. Fortunately, in East Africa, fortunately, we don't have many wild cut companies. We have big companies. If you start from Mozambique, where they have found oil and gas, it is the big ones that are playing there, the Exxon Mobiles, the ENIs, the Totals, the Shell, the what? And by the way, it's nearer where they have found oil to Kampala than to Maputo. Can you imagine? Then the oil we have in Tanzania, the gas we have in Tanzania, the pipelines that we need to cross all these areas. I think in the pipelines you are passing through Lakeshore to Lambo, you are going through maybe nine or so districts with the different governors, with the different local administrations. This is in Kenya. And so all these things, this is, I keep on repeating, we are lucky because the big oil companies can actually carry out the negotiations and make life easy for the government. Because government has balanced politics. Look, Kenya, in 2022, you have elections. 2022, that means you actually have almost one, one year and a half to sort out a lot of things politically. So the same thing, we have elections here in Uganda. So from where God is humans, where he puts this oil in these very challenging areas, yes. requires us and the oil companies to work together to make sure that our own protection of the environment, we are socially acceptable. So doc, Dr. Karanga, good point. I, I want to move on to, to talks. You again as a Get global me? service provider. Um, the, uh, I'd like to continue with that question. The potential impact of oil and gas exploration on vulnerable host communities and their environment. What role does the oil field service sector play in this? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Liz. Um, you know, when we talk about um, out there in the field, it's really the service companies that have uh, the greatest level of uh, exposure to the local communities. And over time, we've learned to understand that the local, local communities at first treat us with a little bit of, uh, of, of uh, trepidation in terms of what have we come to do here and how are we gonna impact or uh, adversely affect their lifestyle. So we've learned to uh, be much more understanding, but the most important thing is that when we go to a local community, we understand that we also need to engage them and provide opportunities for, especially the younger uh, members of the community to benefit from our, from our presence. When it comes to CSRs, uh, when it comes to sponsoring schools, elementary schools, when it comes to sponsoring uh, water wells, for instance, but also when it comes to jobs, we tend to look at how can we provide local jobs for the services or for the work that we're gonna do that will enable the local communities to benefit directly. You know, when you employ three, four people uh, out of a large family, the impact of it is enormous in what it translates into in terms of uh, not just, it's not just a monetary benefit, but the fact that they're now getting exposed to uh, a new way of life and to new technologies and to new means of livelihood. The other thing I think we should also look at is going forwards, you're going to find that especially as happened in Uganda and as it's going to, I expect to happen in Kenya, the regulations of engagement, the regulations under which we have to work 
for instance, when we're working in the, during, in, inside the, uh, the game reserves, there's always a limit on what sort of noise levels are allowed or are going to be allowed while we're, while we're actively drilling or, or completing or producing or building the, 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 the pipelines. And that's fantastic that the likes of Dr. Ellie was involved with, uh, with the ministry and with National Oil Company to guide us and provide regulations, which ultimately makes our industry more sustainable because we have to make ourselves sustainable for the environment. We don't just want to come in and exploit. We want to actually exploit in a sustainable manner such that uh, post this particular activity, the other activities that are to follow will also be able to be conducted and be carried out in a manner in which the environment is not unduly um, uh, impacted. And when you talk about it now, for instance, Baker Hughes uh, two years ago declared that by 2050, we will be carbon neutral. In other words, all our processes in what we design and the way we work and the processes by which we continue to provide our services will be carbon neutral. And that's a big challenge, but for us to have that mindset means that we're now looking at new equipment, new tools, new methods. In fact, even reducing the number of people that we're gonna place out in the locations such that you have less impact less carbon footprint in those locations because you want to keep them as pristine as possible such that when we leave the location you wouldn't even know that there's been activity there where we had a lot of drilling activity and trucks back and forth uh, a lot of um, how would i say uh, a lot of noise uh, a lot of uh, uh, water impacted because even as we have activity there we impact the resources that the local communities are going to need so we ensure that we're not going to just take, we're going to actually ensure that when we leave, it's easier for them, for instance, to access water. It's easier for them to maybe even make use of solar energy. It's easier for them to have schools, small schools that are manageable. It's easier, it's easier for them to have access to teachers by providing roads, because now when we have roads, the teachers that might live far away find it easier to get to the elementary schools or even the, the, the high schools and and, and do their jobs. I remember uh, in Angola many years ago, uh, we had helped to build, uh, to, to fund a small, a, a small local elementary school. And we went back about three years later, only to find that even though the school was there, even though the students were there, the teachers themselves could not come up and, and, and come to work because the roads were not there. So you have the students waiting for the teachers to arrive and the teachers can't get, to, can't get to the school. So you've got to think of all of these things. Every little bit matters. And whatever we can do, ultimately, will end up giving us the sort of students that will end up in colleges and universities, and ultimately will then become our own employees uh, in future. And the benefit is then going to be for everybody. Thank you. So Doris, I just want to continue with that vein very quickly because you are a very big proponent on national content, regional content. You have consulted very heavily and wisely through the World Bank with National Oil, the Ministry of Energy. That question of the host communities and the environment, what is your take? And especially when it, how it affects women, women and, and, and children. First, let me add, you know, on what talks are said, most of these times we are relying on the goodwill of the international companies. So, you know, we need to stop relying on the goodwill of international oil companies. We, when you look at even our government, and now that we have a devout uh, type, uh, type of government, our institutions are not, they don't have capacity, they are not well resourced to even, you know, monitor. The, the, the activities of this company. So you find like even in the locature, the county government, um, is it, does it have officers who have the capacity to monitor what is happening there? Are they even well resourced? So we end up talks, you know, relying on the goodwill of the operators who are there. And whereas we, we are not fully resourced to really uh, monitor. So when you come even and ask the, you know, the environment agencies, the government agencies, what is happening there? They don't have resource. And in, so you're, you're sort of supervising, you know, a very big company and you have only one Land Rover, you know, and no technical expertise. So for us, even to empower those communities, I think we also need to, to have our, our institutions, both 
you know, national and on and uh, county, well resourced and well equipped, and also with the technical skills to be well, you know, to be well. Uh, to well monitor. And then on the issue of local content, national content, and local, 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 I think there is enough regulations and laws now. So I don't think laws alone will be able to help us move forward. You know, we need, for you, Liz, when you look at how many, and when day you can bear this, how many permits do you need to operate? You know, you, you, you move from one office to the other getting permits, you know, you need to, to you know, talks needs you to fill in a tender by 30th, you have to move to the Ministry of Industrialization to NEMA from A, B, you, you keep moving and moving. Yeah? In the meantime, the Chinese company just comes and, you know, through, they get everything they want. On top of that, at what percentages are we getting our finances? Wendy and Liz. So you go to bank, to the banks, you're getting at a very, your finance is at a very high level. So when you talk about local content and national content, it's not enough to just have policies are good, laws are good, regulations are good. But what are the things that make this difficult for us as you know, local companies to operate? To be honest, we have the resources. You may not have done it uh, in Kenya, but you've done it elsewhere. You've, you've been in the international front. Like my company, there are people who work elsewhere internationally. We just need to do it in Kenya. So what needs to happen for us to do it in Kenya? Policy and laws are not enough. We need now to put our, mouth where our, what is it called? Yes, we, we need to put our money where our, our mouth is and just do more to enable local communities and also local entrepreneurs to participate. Excellent point. Since I have you there, Doris, I want us to really emphasize on, on not just the women, um, bringing women in because Tokes had, had mentioned um, about the workforce, the young, the young uh, professionals coming in. In fact, I have a question here from a young um, student. Well, she's no longer a student, she's a graduate. She was actually one of my interns, Hayat Sharif, who's the ex um, SPE, and I think everybody knows her, wonderful um, lady. What does this transition in the oil and gas sector in the country mean for young professionals in the industry? given the situation um, might, take a, might take a while. I, I want you to challenge these men that are sitting there um, in terms <laughs> of bringing, bringing more women in. And uh, we want to also talk a little bit about this Equal by 30 campaign and make sure that they all become signatories, yeah, including first, you, Doris. Okay. First, let me tell a story about Brian. Last Women's Day, I, I was interviewing him as, as part of the Women in Energy, Oil and Gas, and um, so he was, a, he, he was our participants. Do you remember at Intercon Brian? And I asked him, you know, what do we need to encourage uh, more women uh, to get into oil and gas? And Brian told me, you guys need to go to the field. So, and, yes. and I think, yes. And I think we need to talk, talking about, when we talk about women, it's not a cry for help. We are not necessarily, you know, so down. We have companies head, uh, like Liz is heading one, I'm heading one. But just because a few of us are there, there is need for more. And when we talk about, uh, I think, women, it shouldn't be a question of diversity, but a business decision. We know that companies headed by women do better. So it's not even a cry for help. It's not a cry for diversity, but it's also business sense. So I think all the men here, you know, should do more to have women participate. But the young uh, women who are joining the profession, I think when you look at uh, the statistics, like the McKinsey did a report on women in oil and gas, the issue is normally not at the entry level, is retention. Women come in at entry level, but very few go all the way. Of course, the issues are structural and we can take time, but how do we, you young girls joining the profession, stay in it for the long run? There'll be booms and busts, it's not easy, you know. I, I will tell you when I left my job to come to 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 start a company. It was when the oil prices were 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 high. No sooner had I settled in in Kenya, got my child a school in Kenya, than the prices dived. So you must be in it for the long term. And the issue is not entry level, but also staying in. So how can we make like Brian it more? comfortable for women to stay in the field where you want them to be in the, when they, they start having children, when they start having other responsibilities, but also our women who are already in the sector like Liz, can we support others to stay in it for the long run? Because when you look at it, at the entry level, there are many women, 
But as we keep going up, many women keep dropping out. I have to say one thing. Brian, before you answer, I have to say one thing. When I was starting in the field, and, and Turks Aziz will, will also attest to that, uh, in order to make it to where I am, I had to go into the field. But I think we've got to be cognizant. We have these young generation, the Hayat Sharifs, and all these lovely women coming up. We've got to find another way of bringing these women in and progressing them. Um, I don't think the field, uh, saying you must be in the field is there because that's when we start talking about digitization, technology. We can use um, men and women, um, you know, through different areas within the oil and gas. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. No, I think I, think I, I just wanted to echo um, what Doris is saying. I, look, so, so the young lady, Sharice, who asked the question, the last time I met her was actually in Turkana, in the camp. Yeah, and, and I was so happy to see her there, um, sitting in the, in the mess amongst all of these burly men and, and holding her own. Very, very proud. Of, and, and, and I was really happy to see her there. Look, at the end of the day, we hire for skills and capability. I really don't care what gender you are. Yeah, we hire for skills and capability. So there is, you know, I think in, in, in the times we are in now, those biases that were there when I worked offshore and in the years before, I'll by and large, you know, disappearing. Yeah. And so we look at skills and capability. And um, so when you think about our industry and, and, and zooming into East Africa, you know, you have pioneers, you know, people like Mercy Wambogo, who, 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 who started out in this industry a long time ago. Before that, my mother was the first African female manager at Shell and BP services in East Africa. You know, a, a woman who owned her first pair of shoes at 22 years old yeah, and went on to rise and do that. You know, we've got people who then came after that, people like Susan Munyori, we've got people like Michelle Boit today, people like Sharice, who are the next generation. And so I, do, I, I want to you know, just implore any of the ladies on the call that, you know, there is now equal and open opportunity. And we do know from a lot of work done that it's not even about diversity, but it is the, the, the ideas and the idea that companies are always better, you know, when you have a good mix and making sure that you're giving opportunities to, um, to females and equal opportunities also. Um, so for me, the, the, I think the thing to take away for any of these young ladies is that the field is wide open, but you need to be able to take and embrace the opportunities. When I say go to the field, literally that does not just mean go to the field. It also means be ready to embrace any opportunities that, that are there and are available. And don't be afraid to come up and ask for them because you just, you've got to go and grab them. So, so Brian, uh, I, we're going to have a, okay, we have, just one moment before we go. I'm just saying that we're going to have another webinar that's going to be full about this whole, whole topic. And I just want to make one point clear, Brian, women are not looking for handouts. They're looking for access to opportunities and they will work their way up. Okay, sorry, um, Wendy and Katie. So I was actually just going to pass it to Wendy because he's had a oh. virtual hand up. And oh, sorry. Okay, Wendy. Um, and I also want to yeah. point out we are running a poll on this that I would like to announce the results to when it's done. Just asking okay. our audience, are there equal opportunities for women in Africa's oil and gas sector? So, Wendy, on to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Liz, my heart has been up for quite some time, actually. Okay, Thanks, Katie, Katie okay. for saying it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I would like to give um, just uh, an example from, from our company um, in regard to local communities and also in regard to women. The, uh, and I will start with the local communities. First, uh, our mantra for local communities is that uh, we would like um, in, in the long run to see that we have, um, uh, and this is uh, in our strategic plan, that the local communities being our very key stakeholder. We want to leave a sustained positive impact uh, to the local community. And what have we done about this? I think first, um, I, I'll give this very much in reference to uh, the projects before EOPS and then the projects at the time of EOPS. The, before uh, even EOPS started in, uh, in Turkana, we made uh, very significant efforts to make sure that we are employing people from Turkana communities to do, um, well, what are our jobs? Our jobs are mainly either driving or operating heavy equipment. And by the time EOPS was coming in, we were ready to contractually commit to employ at least 30% of our drivers and operators from the, the Trocana region. And we have been uh, consistently increasing on that number. And just when we were somewhere halfway, and perhaps this is the, the, the most important part, 
was that we also started to consider that why don't we have women truck drivers? And uh, people started asking, are you sure? Are you serious that this can work? By the time EOPS was uh, stopping on Monday, I would say that 17 out of 56 EOPS truck drivers were actually women. And they were doing a great job. In fact, when they came in, they even, they even started competing with their male colleagues and trying to show that they could do this much better than men. And we, we had to sit them down and say, uh, uh, hold on, guys, uh, it's not competition. <laughs> we just want to do a great job here. And these women are doing a fantastic job. So as much as people may want to say that the job of um, uh, you know, uh, operators for heavy equipment and drivers for heavy trucks is not a women's job, that is completely not true. We got some uh, of the best women drivers in Kenya. They have been doing a fantastic job. And uh, we, we intend to increase that number to much bigger numbers. Okay, thank you. I see Tokes has raised his hand. And then I want to move on to um, uh, refineries and other infrastructure. Tokes? I just, uh, look, I want, to, I want to give a shout out to, to the ladies um, because, uh, you know, um, I tell you, even five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, what the ladies in the industry uh, are doing in Kenya and that I've seen also in Tanzania uh, is amazing uh, for what is a nascent industry uh, that is known to be uh, a rough and tumble environment. Um, I'll give you an example where one of our, our partners, our local partners here in Kenya, uh, the, the highest uh, employee in that company, this is Bentworth, Bentworth Energy, the highest employee is a lady. And she led, you know, with the, with, under the followership of the CEO, she was able to prove to Tolo that a local company can deliver services in pressure pumping, cementing in the tough uh, uh, Turkana environment doing successfully under enormous pressure to the point where when we started having technical meetings, if she didn't attend, they would be asking, where is Lynette? And that just goes to show you how you transform yourself from uh, being stereotyped to being seen as uh, a role model. And so I, I just want to say, you know, the ladies, uh, especially in Kenya, the ladies in Uganda, and even the ones that we've had uh, and I employ in Tanzania about four or five years ago, have proven themselves without a doubt. And it's just a matter of them being given the opportunity to sit at the table, to have equal access. And perhaps what the government needs to look at is some form of fund that will be uh, earmarked for the lady entrepreneurs who want to get into the energy industry, whether it be oil and gas, whether it be geothermal, whether it be gas, uh, because we're crying out for that kind of diversity because they come with a different mindset. And uh, I, I have no doubt that they will be successful. Thank you, thank you, and, and, and well said, uh, Tokes. I just want to move um, our, our subject matter to an area that I'm seeing a lot of people are asking about, and that's dealing with the refineries and as well as the pipeline. Uh, doc, Dr. Karuhanga, Dr. Eli. So uh, Uganda has decided and has said, and you su fully support that we should have a refinery. For those who may not know, um, the refinery in Uganda will be a 60,000 barrel capacity starting at around 20, 25,000. Um, and uh, there are people that are for it and people that are against it. But Dr. Ellie can tell us why this pipeline, sorry, this refinery is important and how does it affect volumes in the pipeline? And does this affect the pipeline itself? And I'm talking about the East Africa crude pipeline from Uganda to Tanzania. Dr. Eli. You know, um, oil is a strategic resource. Now we have oil, so why not refine it? Why not add value? The problem is that oil companies are very reluctant to, to get into this revival business. They always say it's not profitable. But we, we carried out research, we carried out consultancy research, we hired the top of, of the best in the industry from Western world. They said our refinery would be very profitable. It would be good for our country, good for the region, and we would not have to wait for the refiners in, in Kuwait and Qatar to bring kerosene to my mother. 
So why not use our own resource? Really, it's a basic, simple question. And so the answer to that question is it doesn't have to be academic or economists to do this. So secondly, it creates employment for our people. It also gives us an opportunity to learn, to get you know, technology transfer. It also utilizes our resources, creates employment for our young people, opens opportunities. Mm -hmm. Look at our past interior in Africa, where we are. All these people have transport. When this uh, coronavirus came to us, you saw how many kilometers we had to see of trucks from Maraba to Kenya, 50 kilometers of trucks, people to be traced. I mean, bringing oil tankers from abroad, we have our oil, why not? The challenge we have here is um, getting the right people to believe in us and invest in us. So now we have good companies. Right now, um, the company which is doing feed and which is a partner for our final is Saipo, which is a subsidiary of ENI. And now ENI is in Mozambique. Then we have Total. Then we have Total, which is interested in the pipeline. And, and we have Sinop, which is interested in the refinery. So it's important that these refineries, we look at them, they are not unprofitable. In any case, they are there for, for a good, a bad day. When something doesn't happen, you have something to rely on. 60,000 barrels a day is nothing in our region. So why not go for it? In any case, the after the dropouts, the things that come out, we have to import all the things that we can get out of the petrochemical industry in a country like Uganda, which is really a warehouse for the region, which is land linked. It will be so helpful. So I am a, a refinery advocate. And you think about it. We are going to be spending maybe about $12, $13 per barrel as tariff in the pipeline. Now, if the price for oil has come down to 30, so what, how much money are you getting out of the oil? So why not add value now and maybe keep that 13 in the country and use pipelines for taking the white products to distribute it to the region? So this it makes really, a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I'm, so I'm not a, but it sounds politically correct. So this really points to what Doris was saying, that there, there are decisions that we as a country, as a region, have to make irrespective of the international operators that are coming here, which then pulls me to you, Brian. Um, why are we not having that same debate? We have a refinery already uh, at the coast, but you hear all sorts of things, oh, it can't be converted, it's too old, it's too expensive. Tell me. Yeah, so, so um, this debate is great and, uh, you know, it's always great listening to Honorable um, Ellie because I think some of the points he makes are very, very valid around job creation, around looking at diversifying economies. And, and on, on the subject of refineries, actually, and, and also that we we're talking about women, I'll also give a shout out to Abigail Mwangi, who is also one of the driving forces at the Ministry of Petroleum, but was also one of the pioneers at the Kenya Pipeline Refineries Limited. So I think for when you're having some of these discussions, you need to bring Abigail in. Um, for me, I agree very much so with um, a lot of the things that Honorable Ellie has said. But the one caveat that I will put in there is refineries are indeed, um, we still need to take into account the economics. Now, if it is possible to make a small refinery work and looking at the East Africa region, that, that they, the white products produced from there are able to compete on a net back basis with what comes into Mombasa from the OTS, you know, that all well and good, so that we don't have governments having to subsidize these white products. Yeah. But at the same time, what we need to be doing is we need to be increasing our resource base across uh, the countries in East Africa. Because the higher the volumes that we're able to produce out of the ground, the only way to produce volumes out of the ground is at the end of a drill bit, period, full stop. So we must encourage more exploration, we must encourage more resource development so that we have higher output, which then actually gives greater credence for having a refinery mm -hmm. and let us have something optimal so that let's say why can't we have one refinery in the region mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. that is able to deal with the higher volumes that then the economies of scale work out so oh. I, I think it is a combination of, of looking at at, at, at at interest within job creation and the spin off effects but you also need to look at the economics and increase the resource base so that we can have cogent arguments around actually refining 
when we get to a point where we have significant volumes. So does that bring us to the argument um, that the refinery in Uganda could be serviced by oil coming out of Kenya if we're looking at a reassignment of the pipelines? As Wendy rightfully pointed out, there's nothing yet set in stone as to really what pipeline we're going to be using within the region. Yeah, I mean, I, to you. Is, that, is that to me? Yeah, that's you. Okay. So, so you know, there's the, the geopolitical angle. And, and uh, I think I'll play the role of NJ Ayuk sometimes, who's quite controversial. Um, there's the geopolitical angle to this, where we know economically the optimal, it's not optimal to have two pipelines within this close region. The optimal would be one. But then there's still the geopolitical considerations. So ultimately, it looks like with, with the FID, um, and NJ is saying he's a nice guy. You're a nice guy, NJ. Um, <laughs> actually, it looks like, you know, with, with an FID pending in Uganda, you know, as I said, there's no steel that's been put in the ground yet, but it does look like there's further credence and support for, for that pipeline. The Loki Chart to Lamu pipeline will have to stand on its own two feet also economically to make sure that the economics make sense. But if we are able to learn from this and then able to say, okay, when it comes to the point of where we have a resource base that is high enough, perhaps we tie in the Southern Sudanese Block B fields, we look at increased exploration and we have more output coming out from Kenya when we get to an FID, more output from Uganda, and then look and say, well, what is the optimum in, in, terms, in terms of looking at this? So, so you know, at the end of the day, I, I think you have to overlay the economics also on the geopolitical considerations. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Wendy, because we're going to start wrapping up. Do you see the South Sudanese, we talk about East Africa, and we sometimes forget about South Sudan, who are the only producing nation in East Africa. Do you see um, South Sudan playing a bigger role? maybe um, in this whole pipeline debate or just the whole production. Wendy, your mic is off. Okay, good. Um, if you go back to the, to the Lapset uh, story uh, for Kenya, you'll find that uh, the, the initial discussion about a crude oil pipeline in Kenya was not about Kenyan oil or Ugandan oil. It was about uh, South Sudan oil, and um, uh, basically the consideration here was that uh, where oil production is in, in uh, South Sudan, even if you are all the way north in the Abuye region, it is still nearer to go to the Indian Ocean coast than go to Port Sudan um, in, uh, in the Sudan. So that was considered as a, a service that uh, Kenya can offer to provide a shorter route to, to go to the Indian Ocean for the South Sudan crude. And then, of course, came the, the discovery of oil in Uganda and later discovery of oil in Kenya. So this um, story started to evolve. Um, and apparently, also, <laughs> along the same, the same time, uh, of course, South Sudan became a, became a state. So the potential for uh, combining all these um, uh, uh, transportation as one is, a, is certainly uh, going to bring a, a, a high level of economies of scale. Uh, you are able to build a bigger pipeline and, uh, and certainly the transportation per, per barrel cost would, uh, would be significantly less. So for me, I think, I think this is a goal. Um, and um, uh, of course the geopolitical discussions, uh, countries are sovereign countries will make their their own decision whether they use economics or they use for politics to decide how to, to make such decisions. It's, it's really up to them. But from a purely political angle, I mean, uh, uh, economic angle, I think one pipeline could be good. Uh, Brian just mentioned Block B uh, in Southern Sudan, which, is, uh, which borders Kenya's uh, Block 11B and uh, 11A uh, in the north. Uh, the block block B is is a massive uh, block with massive potential. I think the block itself is bigger than some of the countries we have in East Africa. It's 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 a very very large block on the plain there. So if crude oil is discovered there and you have a pipe that you can join, then um, I think that would be good for everyone. But let me say just something small uh, uh, about uh, the, the refinery bit. Um, uh, perhaps approaching it from the point of view of whether somebody should have or should not have a refinery is, is not, uh, in my view, the best angle. Um, 
my uh, concern is if like now in Kenya we say you will not produce oil unless you also commit to refine it here. Uh, because the value driver is the crude oil uh, on the wellhead, I think the approach should be, why don't you produce the crude oil? Drill for more crude oil. Because when you start producing crude, you also encourage more explorers to bring more oil into production. And therefore, the discussion about the refinery and whether it's economically viable or not would perhaps just sort itself out. But if you say the little oil we have found cannot be uh, uh, ref uh, produced without refining it in the country, you probably then gag the whole process uh, of the um, investment decisions and, and perhaps then things take this much longer to be sorted. Okay, excellent. As I start um, winding down, I just want to ask you one question as I move down the panel. Um, the role of national oil, the National Oil of Corporation of Kenya, um, what is the role and do you see that we can expand it, especially in the upstream sector? And in particular, looking at all these discoveries that we need to, um, to, to start looking at, uh, particularly offshore. Um. If you look at uh, national oil companies um, the world over, uh, you'll find that uh, at the initial stages of the industry development, that's probably one of the places where you can find uh, the people who do understand about um, the geology, the prospectivity of the country and uh, where the oil is. And then you, of course, have the ministry, which uh, kind of mirrors uh, in terms of capability to what the, the national oil company has. And then eventually, when you start going into um, uh, actual production and development and production, uh, you find that uh, uh, the national company, by its very nature being a, a body corporate, it is able to engage in some commercial operations that the, the ministry would find it a bit more difficult. So you end up in this kind of uh, a three uh, pointed uh, organizational or institutional framework, where on one hand, you have uh, the the government, which uh, the government ministry, which may uh, would run uh, obviously the, the 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 policy and be the owner of the resource on behalf of the people, and um, and and perhaps do some licensing uh, as well. In some places, the national oil company does the, the licensing, but when it comes to uh, operating the oil field, you are either having the private parties, and if there is any party in the government who would go and operate the oil field then you would have the national oil company being the one that has that capability to do that. And of course, the third party is the regulator uh, who would also have to, to, to stand alone and work with the ministry to ensure that everything works smoothly. So in this case, then the role of the national oil company would be to, uh, to be the party on the government side, uh, noting that the government is the owner of the resource and uh, stewards the, uh, the exploitation of the resource on behalf of the people of the country then who is the party that can operate uh, in there? And the National Oil Company fits their square. It can also carry the, the government uh, participation. Most PSCs have uh, the government participation option. So when the government participates, uh, who therefore then uh, does uh, that job? It is the National Oil Company. It has a big role. It has to be the one to train the people and carry the capabilities that uh, would be in, involved in the, included in the government. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we haven't really had much time in this session to talk about this uh, as we're winding down again, uh, Mr. Tokes. But the role of technology, uh, and I know Baker Hughes is a, is a leader in technology in the oil field sector. Is this something that you're incorporating within um, your projects in this part of the world? And how can local companies tap into this? Tokes? Um. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, look, the, the requirements that have been set by the operators, uh, whether it be um, whether it be Total uh, in Uganda or Tolo in Kenya or even ENI in Mozambique, uh, the, the main projects that are ongoing right now in East Africa, the requirements and the the levels are very very high. Uh, and like I said earlier, it's not just technology, but technology for the future. In other words. Uh, technology that will make everything ultimately cheaper, but also uh, bearing in mind the, the potential impact on the environment. So we've been tasked with uh, working with rigs that can uh, move very quickly, agilely, 
without with very little, uh, leave a very little footprint after they leave the location. Um, the the the, um, the specs given to us for the equipment that we're going to utilize, uh, even the drilling systems that we're going to utilize in Uganda and potentially in Kenya are going to be systems that have been recently developed. So technology is a key driver uh, for what uh, is going to be unleashed in this part of the world. Uh, but most importantly, what's good is that the local companies that we're partnering with and those that are already on the ground are going to take, they're going to benefit from these technologies and be able to carry them forward into future projects uh, with time. Okay, excellent. So, um, Brian, parting words, because um, we need to start wrapping up. Uh, can you give us your parting words and in particular, you know, allay fears for those here in Kenya in terms of the oil and gas sector? Yes, yeah, so I, think, I think for me, um, what, what I would like to implore is, is both the government and, you know, the, the international companies, Talo, ENI, is we need to quickly agree and settle these commercial terms. To, to allow and facilitate exploration, to grow that resource base, to allow and, 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 and post, you know, force majeure, the FID of the Rocky Char project, because otherwise we will be left behind. Um, you know, the argument that the oil will always be on the ground and it belongs to us does not really hold at all. The world is moving and we don't want to be left behind, stagnating. And this very much harks to a lot of the things that NJ says, we need to commercialize and develop um, these resources and our economies now more so particularly post covid when we've seen the number of the, the, the rates of unemployment and the, and the and the hits on our economies in the east african region that this has caused we need this is a spur and it would be a shot in the arm uh, for all of our economies if we can accelerate these developments yeah? because the energy transition is also not going to stop us and is ongoing so my my please please let us work together in a collaborative fashion to try and get you know these projects going to give our region a much needed shot in the arm Thank you. Doris, uh, your parting, parting words, please. Doris? I, I think for me, the COVID uh, situation presents a good and uh, a very good opportunity for the local companies. I remain optimistic that, uh, you know, most international companies and majors will have to do a lot with the little they have. So as talks have said, technology will be transferred. So I think it's for us to step up and be ready and do and, and, and keep being optimistic and also look at other areas, diversifying, like other areas where we can employ our skills and competencies like Geodamo and all that as we wait for this. And for the government, I think it's a time to do the unglamorous work right now. You know, we need the story of oil in Kenya to stop being about locature. This means I saw they, they are doing the multi-client data survey that is very important and also having the offshore bid rounds and also doing actual the actual work of if we are saying Kenya is going to be a hub then we need to do the actual work to get Kenya to be the hub and by supporting more businesses and having the right infrastructure but overall I remain optimistic thank you thank you yeah. Doris uh, uh, honorable Eli Karuhanga can we can you give us the last parting words before we shut down Dr Eli Is Dr. Ellie there? Dr. Dr. Ellie, you're on mute. Can you unmute your microphone? I remain, and I remain a serial East African. And I think we, many of our countries have been counting their chickens before they are hatched. I want us to face reality. The other day, some time ago, I invited the Kenya National Oil Company to Uganda and I could see that if we had one national East African oil, national oil company, we would do great things together. I now realize with the delay and this uh, force majeure is coming into Kenya, 800 million barrels per day to be pumped out of Loksha are going to be held back. And I see FID is likely to close in Uganda. I would love very much to see many Kenyans coming to work in Uganda to develop our oil. Of course, I don't mind other international countries to come in. I don't mind the Filipinos and Indians and Chinese and all those people to come. But the first people I would love to welcome and have a drink with in the evening is Nyaga. I have just heard always about Brian, Brian, Brian. 
you negotiated the government contracts before you ran away to Ghana and took a good, a good job. I would like to see the force that we have in Kenya come and join the force we have built over 14 years in Uganda and do a hub, an East African hub. We should stop talking like this. When Uganda was going to declare, to declare the ground of licenses, we did it in Mombasa. That's what I would like to see. I would like to see an East African unity. And I want to call on our leaders to really, really stop thinking in small measures and talk about Kenya hub, Uganda hub, this hub. No, this resource requires all our efforts as East Africa. And we have enough capacity. And my friend from Baker Hughes, wake up and start working with Africans. There are so many people who are trained. You don't have to keep on bringing people from Houston. We are here, we are capable of doing this job. And we have potential. And we need to get technology here and get it in the hands of our people. We have our resources, we have our people's resources. We have more educated people on earth today in East Africa than we had ever had before in the past. So why not? We've trained many people, women. Women are so trained here in Uganda. If you go to Ghana, you find Ghanaian, Ugandan women at the rig in the Indian Ocean. Please, we have people scattered all over the world. Let's do our work together. Thank you very much for this work. Thank I, you so I, I much. Like so to step in there real yes, quick, uh, go ahead, go ahead. I'd like to step in real quick, Dr. Ellie. Uh, uh, Liz, if I may. Uh, Becky Hughes has always championed uh, um, the use of local employees. And as a matter of fact, the country leader for Becky Hughes in Uganda is Ugandan. So we've always supported uh, uh, our local employees and we'll continue to do that across Africa. Thank that you. is what we do okay. and that's what we'll continue to do. So uh, we're in support of, of working local, local talent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Before I get hammered by, <laughs> by Katie and, and Ida, because we've gone over time, I, I knew this was going to be a very interesting webinar. I promise we will hold more of these in this particular segment. We have a lot more coming in. I urge all our listeners um, to please, I know we didn't answer everyone's questions. Um, I'd like you to send your questions either to me. A lot of you know me. Just send them to me and I'll make sure that they're sent to the relevant individuals. If you want to be introduced, you know, um, we're like a dating service here in Africa Energy Chamber. We'll be more than happy to uh, put you together and, and see where that relationship comes in. But I think from the takeaways that we've heard from our esteemed panel is that FID is going to happen in Uganda 2020. Um, Brian has urged the government and the oil companies to come together and, and make sure that FID gets back on track. Um, we basically have a trip until September to know where we are. We have a lot more opportunities coming in that we couldn't discuss here, but that is why the Africa Energy Chamber, led by myself and also together with my executive chairman, um, NGI Yuk, who's on the call, we're here to, to help, um, help you get this information. Uh, women, women will play a part. As long as I'm here, women will play a part. Where's Doris? We will make sure that women play a part. Um, and I urge you all, please, equal by 30 signatories. I want to see you become signatories of that. Um, just if you don't know what it's about, please reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to, to discuss. And for all you bankers who are there and keeping quiet, let us find good fundings to make sure that we can create solid companies. You're already doing that. We thank you. We thank you. Thank you. But let's do a lot more. Let's reach out. NJ, we've got people that we need to reach out to, to come here and help the East Africa. And, and talks, you made it very clear, not only oil and gas, we have geothermal. So those of us who have been trained, who have trained in oil and gas can easily trans, uh, you know, move into the geothermal space and work with our brothers and sisters in, the, in that space. So the opportunities are, are here. And last but not least, we thank you to, we thank um, the international oil field service companies. Um, they're the ones who have the knowledge from decades, hundreds of years in the case of of um, <clears throat> Baker Hughes, and uh, let's work. Let, let's work with them. There's no shame in that. As we as we grow, I'm a product of a global oil field service company, Baker Hughes being one of them. And um, uh, for those who may not know, Turks was my boss. 
long time ago when I was a young engineer, and uh, he has seen me develop to, to where I am. So I thank everybody. Please reach out. The Africa Energy Chamber is here to assist. And if you have any other topics you'd like us to, um, uh, to discuss, uh, we're here. Thank you, panelists. Uh, you've been wonderful. We're definitely coming back. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I want to thank our audience very much for participating. Um, and I just want to do a quick announcement on some of our upcoming webinars. And um, we are doing these weekly. Next week, we have Closing Deals, Advancing FID During COVID-19, as well as Navigating Risk, Increasing Threats in the African Energy Market Under COVID-19. Um, if you can find more information on all of our webinars at www.aopwebinars.com. And thank you so much to our lovely panelists um, and our really um, very engaging audience. And everybody have a great day ahead. Thank you.